Tanlin, or body conditioning, is a part of traditional Okinawan karate, but not so much in modern karate. Uh, a common warm-up practice is called kitae, where the body parts that would make contact with an attacker are desensitized by striking them under controlled conditions. One way is by using what's called a taketaba, a bundle of bamboo sticks that, that smart but don't cause the injury. They can be replaced in time with a tetsutaba, the same thing with metal wire instead of bamboo. Okay. Then we have kote kitae, where the different surfaces of the forearms are conditioned by progressively banging them into your partner's arms. Or some other tool. In addition to having a desensitizing effect, it's an exercise to develop coordination and the ability to solidly smack into the opponent's limbs. Even the basic exercises of some styles are designed to make the body more impervious to blows. And then there's makiwara training. The makiwara, as you may know, is a bundle of rice straw wrapped around with a rope made of the same stuff to make a pad that's attached to a post that has some give to it. It's used to practice the various strikes in a way that progressively allows you to condition your striking surfaces and learn how to deliver stronger and stronger impact to the target. Yes, modern times have given us new materials and I have used rubber pads, canvas and leather covers, but I still prefer the traditional rice straw because it's just different. I first assumed that the Okinawans used it because it was cheap and abundant. I gradually realized that they probably had the best material to work with from the very start. There's a funny thing about rice straw. It appears to be bacteria static. That is, bacteria won't grow on it very easily. And when you, when you cut your skin on the pad, as sometimes happens, it's less likely to get infected compared to other materials. So somebody must have paid attention back in the pre-antibiotic era and used the materials that were the safest. That's pretty cool. This makiwara gave me fits for a time. I anchored it into the ground like uh, using rocks, like is traditionally done. But I kept digging the hole bigger as I hit harder and harder, and it became loose. I'd fill it in with more dirt, and the same thing would happen. Finally, I got mad and sank it in cement. And now I find I'm moving the cement. So to compensate for the angle that I've created by hitting it so much, I put a wedge of rubber behind the pad to bring the surface back to plumb. This way I hit it at the right place. The smaller pad is good for accuracy. You might be wondering, yes, this is the same rice straw that's woven into tatami mats to make the floors for Japanese houses. And by the way, Rice straw is an agricultural product that you're not allowed to just bring into this country. And I have no idea how this got here from Japan, okay? Consistent training on this type of equipment produces hands that are truly weapons. The joke back in the 60s when I first started training was uh, that when your hand started to look like a foot, you were getting somewhere. <laughs> I go in and out of condition, uh, like a lot of people, but even when the calluses have softened, my 68-year-old hands can still hit a rock. When I'm sitting at my desk, I have this nice smooth rock here, and when I can't take time out to go hit the makiwara, I can just 
get off a quick 200 or so on this nice rock. Speaking of the 60s, in September 1968, Black Belt Magazine once had a story about hand conditioning. Uh, since a teacher named Tak Kubota was famous for his developed hands, which he could actually strike with a hammer. They held a forum with several of the big name karate teachers giving their opinions. Most of them, of course, were against hand conditioning. Not one of them was a traditional Okinawan stylist, uh, and all were professional dojo owners. Revisiting that issue today, and uh, realizing that these were all more or less commercial operators who wanted the greatest number of students they could get, it becomes obvious now that the dismissing of hand conditioning might have been a concession that they were willing to make to keep their schools full. Two of them were karate competitors turned teachers, Chuck Norris and uh, Mike Stone. Another one uh, who contributed to the article was Fumio Demura, who became a tremendously popular international instructor and whom I would later come to know personally around the time of his appearing in the Karate Kid movie. One of the participants, though, was my one-time teacher, Stomu Oshima, who certainly didn't see himself as a commercial operator and whose organization's training was among the toughest out there. Mr. Oshima once said in a Black Belt magazine article, Look at my hands. They're not hard. Actually, the material of the hands is quite soft, yet I can break a person's bones with just a blow if I wished. Having been hit by him, I can attest to the fact that his hands can do damage to you, at least if he hits a body without much internal conditioning. And certainly anyone who was in awe of him crumpled at his touch. That's just the psychological advantage of being the top dog. What's missing in this debate is the psychological effect, the power of the conditioned body, and particularly conditioned hands, to free you of fear and allow you an uninhibited use of your limbs in fighting. Let's try an experiment. Poke yourself in the eye and try not to blink. Will yourself not to blink. You know it's coming. Don't blink. Don't blink. You, you, don't, <laughs> you don't have to do this to know that 10 out of 10 times you will blink. Because the nerves in your eyes, or, or anywhere else, will send a pain signal to your brain as fast as lightning. And just as fast, the brain will send a signal to the muscles to get away from that as soon as possible. This is the default programming of the human nervous system, until you train it to do something else. Using the eye example, anyone who has adopted the use of contact lenses has gained the ability to touch the eyeball, something ordinarily your body will not let you do. What's missing in Mr. Oshima's quote about soft hands is the fact that while soft hands can deliver a powerful blow, they receive injury quite easily. Mr. Oshima's system did not require uh, Makiwara training, partly I think because he built up his organization from college clubs where there were no Makiwara or other traditional training devices on university property. In fact, a lot of my clubmates made fun of me for the fact that I actually had one. Well, because sparring tended to be somewhat spirited, let's say, in those clubs, uh, injuries were common. It's natural that you start being a little more cautious in sticking out your hands and feet after so many injuries. Now, consider that you've slammed your hands into a rough, resistant post hundreds of times a day for a while. You will start throwing those hands out with complete abandon because you know they can handle something hard and resisting. When you encounter a bone-on-bone -bone clash with someone, you don't cave because you've whacked arms with your partner thousands of times. But an unconditioned person who feels pain immediately feels his muscles pulling him back from the danger. It happens in a fraction of a second. Conditioning frees you from the fear of injury and allows you to throw completely relaxed techniques that are still powerful. 
They're not powerful because your knuckles are rough or bigger than the average person. After all, your grandmother with arthritis probably has big knuckles too. But she can't wade into somebody's attack and flatten him. Well, unless she's my grandmother. Oh, by the way, don't listen to people who tell you you're going to get arthritis from doing this. If you do conditioning correctly, you'll get stronger without permanent injury. The metacarpophalangeal joints, or the MCP joints, big knuckles to you, are designed to move 90 degrees. And these still do. See? Old school karate is really just a lot of common sense once you analyze it. I had a friend who, who trained with us for a time. In his first month, he was bruising everybody just with his warm-ups. Know why? He grew up on his family's dairy farm. At the age of seven, he was carrying heavy milk buckets and driving a tractor. His adult life was spent hammering nails and putting on roofs as a contractor. Somebody who's done this millions of times with something heavy in his hand and absorbed that return shock, he's going to give your arm a good going over no matter how little training he's had. So if I wanted to go all egghead on you, I would say that uh, karate utilizes an overcompensatory principle to induce a somatopsychic feedback loop which enables an effective response to various acts of physical violence. Well, that's the way a friend of mine would put it. I would say it this way. Look, you smash your hand into a post thousands of times. Even if you do it wrong in the beginning, your body soon shows you the best way. When you can hit it full strength, you're hitting harder than a human body can stand to be hit. That's the overcompensation part. And you can hit it more times than a human body can stand because you've done it so often. And there's no hesitation in demolishing the person attacking you. Old style karate training isn't complicated. It's based on common sense. And that's what we're trying to put back into self-defense.